Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat window of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or request to use your microphone by raising your hand after the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Catherine Grillo. Catherine is a professor of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Florida and her research focuses on the materiality of cattle-based pastoralism in Eastern Africa and the ways that ceramic technologies have been a critical part of mobile pastoralist repertoires through time and space. Please join me in welcoming Catherine as she gives her talk, Early Herders on the Mbulu Plateau, New Archaeological Evidence from Duhmanda, Tanzania, circa 3100 before present. Thanks everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, webinar. I, I haven't met very many of you before, so I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with you about this work and you know, potential collaborations moving forward. Uh, thanks for that introduction. I am, and also thanks to Andrew Harvey for inviting me. I am very grateful. Okay, I'm gonna give you a, brief introduction really to the work that I've been doing with a big team of people on uh, the Mbulu Plateau in Tanzania uh, at a site called Lakmanda. Uh, the co-directors of the project, uh, I should mention, it's, uh, it's me, uh, Dr. Mary Prendergast at Rice University, uh, Dr. Agnes Gidna, who's at the National Museum in Tanzania, and uh, Dr. Odex Mabula, who's a professor at the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, so, and I'll keep my eye on the chat box if anybody has uh, questions during, I'm happy to, to try to address them. Okay, so my overall uh, interest is in answering this question, which is what can we learn about the present and future of pastoralist systems by examining their long-term archeological histories? Um, as as I'm sure you all know, so pastoralism, um, just to define it very briefly, it's a way of life economically, culturally centered on the herding of livestock. It typically implies some degree of residential mobility. Uh, herders organize their settlement patterns, for example, around the needs of their livestock, moving them to pasture and water, um, as this Maasai woman uh, is doing in Tanzania. I think this picture was from near Ngaruka. It's quite, just to contextualize this a little bit, it's quite hard to find a map that shows where pastoralists live worldwide. Um, but I did find this map of, of global drylands, uh, which take up over 40% of the world's land area. And herding systems are common across much of this area. And it's, you know, needless to say, herding has had a really tremendous impact on social and environmental landscapes across the globe. Uh, and there's been, from archaeologists, there's been a real surge of interest over the last few decades into the ways that pastoralism originated in various forms around the world, um, from, you know, Southwest Asia to the Andes to Eastern Africa. Um, I think we used to think that herders would be relatively invisible in the archaeological record because if they're mobile, they wouldn't leave very much behind. Um, but uh, we know now that that's not that there's plenty to find, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some of the things that we do find today, so that we can better understand these global histories of herding. Okay. Um, in Africa, uh, you know, tens of millions of people rely on herding livestock uh, for survival, and often in arid or semi-arid places where rainfall is too scarce and too unpredictable um, for agriculture. And so in Eastern Africa, uh, as you know, cattle pastoralism is the most common. Um, people also have sheep and goats, sometimes donkeys. Uh, in really dry areas, people have camels. I, my doctoral dissertation was actually, this was a while ago at this point, but uh, it was an ethno-archaeological study in Samburu in northern Kenya, uh, where I was studying 
pottery production and, and various other types of material culture. Um, in St. Bernard today, I, there is agriculture is seasonal agriculture is possible to some degree. Um, and in many places there have been shifts towards sedentarization. Um, this is common across East Africa and, and land is being leased to larger scale farming operations. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that, that pastoralists are uh, dealing with across Eastern Africa today. And of course, climate change is really wrecking havoc in a lot of these uh, dry land environments. Okay. But what do we know? You know, okay, so Samburu, Maasai, for example, have been in Eastern Africa for um, hundreds of years. But what do we know about longer term archaeological histories of herding in Eastern Africa? I, Mary and Louis Leakey pictured here. Uh, they're more famous for their work as paleontologists, of course. But um, they started excavating pastoral sites back in the 1920s um, and 1930s. Uh, Louis Leakey found pots like this one at several burial sites in the Central Rift. Uh, in, in Kenya, uh, and then Mary Leakey excavated sites uh, such as Hyrax Hill um, in, central Keri in central Kenya, uh, which uh, has a big cemetery and is, is quite famous amongst those of us who study ancient pastoral cemeteries in East Africa, I suppose. <laughs> um, but then later work in the 1980s uh, by scholars such as Fiona Marshall, um, Simiu Wandiba, uh, Larry Robbins, and others uh, established that, that herding has been a, a way of life in Eastern Africa for at least 5,000 years. Okay. I want to give you a really brief crash course in Holocene African archaeology. Um, the Sahara Desert used to be green. Um, I, 10,000 years ago, for example, hunting, gathering, fishing communities lived alongside uh, lakes and rivers. And then sometime after 7,000 years ago, the Sahara started to dry out. Um, uh, cattle, and so hunter-gatherers adopted uh, some domestic livestock, cattle and sheep and goats, um, probably donkeys that, that came in with their herders uh, from Southwest Asia. Um, there is spectacular pastoralist rock art across the Sahara in places like the Tadra Dukakis in Libya. Um, and as the Sahara continued to desiccate, um, people, uh, people moved um, into the Nile Valley, for example, and then to parts of Western Africa, and then, and then down into Eastern Africa. And Sorry if you can hear my cat meowing. Um, we don't know exactly how herding came to East Africa, um, geographically speaking. So consider this a very imprecise arrow. Um, we're really only beginning to understand through new ancient DNA research, bioarchaeological research, um, what relationships herders may have had with hunter-gatherers already in this region. But anyways, we know that herders arrived about 5,000 years ago uh, in the Turkana Basin, which is up, you can see Lake Turkana up here, uh, which is of course more famous for paleontology. It's known around the world for sites like Kubifora. It's where they found Turkana boy, Nereokotame boy. Um, but the more recent archeology span of this region is, is much less well-known. The histories of herding are much less well-known, but we've ar we'd argue they're just as important. And so the time period that we're talking about here is called, we call it the pastoral Neolithic. So these are stone tool using um, uh, herders. Okay. There are at least uh, six pastoral Neolithic, um, these megalithic sites that we call pillar sites uh, surrounding Lake Turkana. Um, this is my other main project, uh, archeological project is here. Um, and I work at these sites with uh, Elizabeth Hildebrand and lots of other uh, colleagues. Um, this is the site of Lothigam North. It's number one on this map down here. Um, it's a gigantic cemetery, a big megalithic cemetery dating to about 5,000 years ago. Um, I'm gonna just show you a, a few pictures um, because a lot of what we know about the pastoral Neolithic are from these pillar sites, which really only saw 
uh, new and intensive excavations in the last 10 years. Um, so these are cemeteries. Each uh, shape here is a burial. Um, they are uh, mostly primary burials. They've been placed very carefully one on top of the other in a big central burial area. Um, the bioarchaeological work is led by my colleague, uh, Elizabeth Sawchuk. Um, but this was a, a massive construction, this cemetery. It was well planned from the beginning. They had to remove a lot of beach sand, shore up the edges, and then bury a lot of people. And we think that uh, using ground penetrating radar, we've excavated as little of this site as possible. Um, we think there's a minimum of about 580 individuals here. Um, it was later, the burials were capped with a layer of cobbles. Um, And uh, with the burials, we find things like uh, stone beads and so forth, thousands of stone beads. Um, everybody, nearly everybody in these burial grounds uh, are, are wearing ornamentation of some kind. And we, there are men, women, elderly people, young babies. Uh, and it really is just a, a slice of the entire community um, buried at this site, uh, at these pillar sites. And, um, and the reason this is really interesting is that we don't have evidence for social hierarchies of any kind. It's not like it was only adult men being buried in these cemeteries. It was really uh, lots of people um, and buried in very idiosync idiosyncratic ways. Uh, one individual, for example, had a headdress made out of gerbil teeth. Um, and uh, that being said, we really um, see this as a, a community effort. We know that climate change at this time was uh, really dramatic. Um, we know in terms of why people built these cemeteries all of a sudden, we know that the lake levels were dropping nearly 100 meters at this point. Um, and for us, uh, you know, the big questions are, well, how do people respond to climate change um, in the past and, and today, of course? And in the past, it really seems like herders and hunter-gatherers came together in a spirit of cooperation to some degree to build these big megalithic sites. We don't see any evidence for violence or anything like that, which you might have expected as things, you know, conditions were deteriorating. Um, and instead we see, um, yeah, we see a really interesting uh, case study for uh, cooperation. Um, so anyway, I think that's about all I'm going to say about those pillar sites. So, you know, those pillar sites are up here around Lake Turkana. They date to about 5,000 years ago. And then um, at that time, I, the environment continued to dry out. Uh, and so people spread farther south. And all these black dots are uh, known, these are the known pastoral Neolithic sites. They, they span from the earliest sites up here in the Turkana Basin are about 5,000. Um, the sites in the Central Rift are about 3,000 mostly. And they range from about 3,000 up to 1,200 um, before present. Um, and they extend, uh, southward all the way down to Lismanda, which is the farthest south uh, of the known pastoral Neolithic sites. And it's also one of the earliest, which is puzzling to us because, um, you know, we think people were moving south, so why are the earliest sites um, in the rift the ones farthest south? And we, we really just think that climate change was so dramatic at this point that people must have moved relatively quickly. We also, there is a, um, there was a, a lot of work done, a lot of archeological research done uh, here in the Kenyan Central Rift, but a lot of those sites have not been dated. They were excavated a long time ago and it's possible that we just don't have the dating right. And, um, and we're sure that there are many, many, many other sites out there and as research continues, uh, surely we'll be able to say more about um, chronology and so forth. But Luxmond is really exciting, not only because it's the farthest south, but it's also the largest by far of all the settlement sites that we have um, in Eastern Africa. And it's very, uh, there's a lot about the site that has been very surprising to us. And that's partly what I'm gonna tell you about today. Okay, 
Um, so this is uh, this is what the site looks like. <laughs> it's um, this is it's way up on the Mbulu Plateau, and of course this is the area um, where uh, Iraq communities live today. There's a little town called Lismanda just just down the road. Um, that that's what the site is named for. Um, and uh, you know what we're trying to figure out is is really what an occupation site looks like for the pastoral Neolithic. We really don't have very good data about this. And, and Luxmana, because it's the biggest, um, is one of the earliest, is really exciting for us. Um, it was occupied, so we know from the pottery and the stone tools that it was occupied by um, what we call Savannah pastoral Neolithic herders. So during the pastoral Neolithic overall in East Africa, Archaeologists have identified two main um, material culture traditions, if you will. There's the Savannah Pastoral Neolithic, and then there's one called the Elman Titan. And um, they have different styles of pottery and different styles of stone tools. And they also tend to settle in, in different places. Um, and so uh, this is a savanna pastoral Neolithic site, and uh, based on the animal bones found at the site, we know that it was occupied by cattle, sheep, goat, and donkey herders um, 3,000 years ago. We have a pretty good radiocarbon chronology for it. Um, so most of the other pastoral Neolithic sites that have been excavated in East Africa have been found in rock shelters, um, partly because if you're an archeologist um, and you go to a rock shelter, you're likely to find something. Um, people tend to use rock shelters and stuff tends to preserve in them. Um, but open air sites like this one are really rare. Um, and even though we're sure that people were living, you know, in, at, in places like this, but we very rarely find them. Um, we thought that in Tanzania, we would find sites, um, you know, small numbers of herders kind of struggling on that frontier as the southernmost group, um, as people are expanding farther south. They might have been facing uh, livestock losses from things like trypanosomiasis. Um, they might have been having difficulties in these unpredictable environments as the climate was changing, as these environments were changing 3,000 years ago. But we, that isn't what we found. <laughs> we found uh, what turned out to be really a huge site. And, and when I say we, I mean my colleague, um, Dr. Gidna, Dr. Agnes Gidna, uh, the site is in her family's shamba, uh, essentially. And she brought the pottery to our attention. Um, and we were very lucky then to go down, do some test excavations and discover the biggest pastoral Neolithic site in East Africa. Um, so all credit goes to, to Agnes. Um, this is a little house on the, on the property. Um, and you can see artifacts in this picture. You can see bone fragments. You can see pieces of pottery here on the path. This is a grinding stone. And there's so much material. You can even see it in the house walls. Um, you can see stone tools here. There's, yeah, bits of pottery and so forth. And so, you know, we had an inkling that the site uh, was huge um, because this midden, what looked like a midden, uh, just an accumulation of, of refuse uh, left behind by these herders, uh, extended across like, several hectares. It's it's really quite big. Um, and so we brought uh, teams of students from the University of Dar es Salaam, uh, later, I brought teams of students from, I was at the time teaching at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. Um, and we did a lot of um, I, test excavations at the site starting in 2013. Um, and we've been back a few times. You can see the town of Luxmanda back here. Um, it's, very, it's very cold up there <laughs> anyway. Um, so from these very limited, I. Uh, Oh, wait, I see a question. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Were these burials humation or inhumation graves? These were at the pillar sites, the primary burials uh, in, in those pillar sites. Anyway, I'm happy to talk about those uh, more later. Okay, so we found, 
at the site, um, very substantial assemblages of pottery, uh, lithics, um, faunal remains, uh, bone artifacts, ivory artifacts, um, ground stone objects, including these things that look kind of like axes. Um, uh, and because the dates for the site really are right about 3100, um, it doesn't, the site doesn't seem to have been occupied for, you know, a thousand years or anything like that. What we, what we think we're seeing is really intensive occupation um, over, uh, a, you know, a relatively, well, we don't really know over what degree of time, but um, relatively short, which is very surprising. This is not a, these are not small groups of herders on a frontier who are struggling. This is a very substantial uh, settlement. Okay. Here's what it looks like uh, from the air. This is from Google Earth. Yeah, Google Earth. Um, this is the main uh, house here. That This is the little house with the pottery in the walls that I just showed you up here. Um, and then the site uh, is just in the middle of this field. You can't really tell that it's there. Um, but uh, so we, but as fields were getting plowed, we could see artifacts coming up uh, everywhere. And, but we didn't really know where to start digging. Uh, so we brought a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Tom Fitton, who's at the University of York. Uh, he came and uh, uh, did a magnetometry survey across this whole area. And he really discovered um, that he was seeing uh, anomalies, which uh, we think uh, correspond to ancient activity, uh, essentially in, uh, from the past from the Neolithic in this area here with the white box. Um, and so that's where we uh, ultimately ended up focusing our excavations. The red dots are the, the excavation units that we've put in. And so as you can see, um, we've really only excavated a tiny percentage of the site. Um, totally, I think so far we've done 20, something like 21 square meters, um, maybe a little more since the last field season, but uh, uh, over the course of uh, several field seasons. Um, so I'm gonna come back to those excavation units shortly, um, but I wanted to show you first uh, something else that the magnetometry survey picked up, and this is um, in Preston Antiquity right now. These circular features here, where these arrows are pointing here and here, um, in Tom's sort of extrapolation, you can see them as uh, these sort of rusty orange um, blotches. And um, they were originally labeled thermo remnant debris, but they later turned out to be one of the biggest surprises of our field season in 2018. Um, these are, we cleared out the grass, uh, and it turns out that these are circular features uh, of grinding stones, gigantic grinding stones. Um, and uh, these are not really portable stones in any way. Um, and so this was very odd to us um, uh, that really mobile herders would have had something like this. Here's the second one. It's not quite as big, but uh, it's still, this is before excavation. Um, you can see other excavations were happening behind, but we cleared this one out. Um, we test excavated a very small part of this second feature. Of course, you know, we found these on the last week of excavation, so we only had time to put in this, this, this big of an excavation area. But as you can see, these are huge um, grinding stones, huge lower grinding stones. And we also find lots of uh, upper hand stones and things like this. Um, and uh, and we know that they were surrounded with artifacts from the pastoral Neolithic. We know these are associated with the site. Um, and uh, this was very surprising to us uh, because I, we, oh, go back. Yeah, because up until this point, we had no evidence that herders, highly specialized herders, uh, were processing plants in any way. Uh, and there's a big outstanding question about whether or not herders in the pastoral Neolithic also cultivated anything. You know, it's possible they were cultivating something like finger millet. 
Uh, certainly they were probably also uh, processing a huge range of wild plant foods, but we there was no positive archeological evidence, any data for that uh, at all. No finger millet has ever been found on a pastoral site in East Africa, despite us looking quite, uh, quite seriously for many years. Um, we've never been able to find evidence for plant processing at all, except in, in, in one pot, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but this is very clear evidence that they're doing something. And right now, uh, samples, we're trying to see if there are uh, uh, starches or phytolith residues, residues from plants on these things. So we've sent some pilot samples to uh, Marco Medela's lab in Barcelona, um, and we are eager, eagerly awaiting the results because it would really change our understanding of the pastoral Neolithic. Like, not only do they not seem to be very mobile, which if you think about, you know, we assume that, we always assumed that pastoral Neolithic herders were like the Maasai or like Turkana, uh, the most mobile of those communities, right? Moving around with their livestock, not cultivating anything, but now we're not so sure. So that's really exciting for us. Um, we also found for the first time some very cool evidence for domestic architecture. This doesn't look like much. Um, it's possible that, you, I don't know if you can see these like fragments of kind of hardened earth that are darker orangey than everything else. Um, they seem to us to look like house floors. Um, we, there's some debate about this <laughs> in, our, in our community. Um, but it's it's certainly possible. We definitely have found um, multiple hearths, multiple living surfaces um, at the site, which is really unheard of at pastoral Neolithic uh, settlements. So th the reason that this is chunked out is we we um, uh, were sampling this particular hearth for it's something called micromorphology, which I can tell you about, but. Um, but you can see hardened, uh, burned areas uh, throughout this this area um, that that are hearths. And so, what you know, are we in people's houses? Are we outside of people's houses? We don't really understand what's what's happening here, but very exciting for us. And we think these are what the magnetometer was picking up. Um, actually, this evidence for burning. Um, here's a hearth uh, in the profile of the excavations here. Uh, you can see it in more detail here, but I wanted to um, to mention um, the other really uh, unexpected thing that we found uh, at Luxmanda, uh, which was this: there was an infant burial uh, under uh, a hearth. Um, we, we, yeah, we hadn't planned to excavate burials, um, but we found a tiny, tiny. Uh, infant um, in this as we were just finishing up the excavations in this unit. And from that infant, uh, we were able to uh, obtain ancient DNA. Uh, and it's uh, it reported in this paper. Uh, and it is, uh, so we know it was a little girl. Uh, and it's also the first direct genetic evidence that we have for um, connections between ancient herding societies in East Africa and later herding societies in South Africa. So she, her ancestry is directly related to um, an individual found at Castilburg, uh, who dates to about 2000 years ago uh, in South Africa. We always thought that herding spread. We, I mean, we knew that herding had to have spread from uh, East Africa down into Southern Africa, but until now we never had any um, direct genetic evidence for that. Uh, and so um, this is really uh, exciting. My colleague, Dr. Mary Prendergast led a paper, um, uh, a few, this is 2019, uh, published in Science uh, with uh, other uh, ancient DNA evidence from Eastern Africa. And I, you know, archeologists are increasingly collaborating with ADNA uh, folks. Um, we are increasingly able to um, to retrieve DNA from ancient skeletons and so forth. And this paper really uh, is incredibly important. 
uh, it is really the first um, evidence that we had for, in terms of you know people's ancestry, uh, how did herders get to East Africa? Where did they come from? Uh, who are they related to today? And so forth. Um, and it shows uh, a, um, a multi-step spread of herding and farming uh, into Eastern Africa. And, um, and I just wanna, I guess let me, I'll just kind of read this. The picture is a little hard to disentangle, but we know that um, you know, we have in East Africa, hunter-gatherer uh, individuals that we've gotten genomes from, um, those we consider a later stone age, what we call. And then we have um, early pastoralist, pastoral Neolithic individuals who are most closely related to present day Afro-Asiatic speakers. Um, and then pastoral Iron Age sites, um, individuals from those sites uh, show affinities to present day Nilotic speakers. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the, a very abbreviated version of what the DNA shows. Um, but we do think um, that um, I, yeah, that the ancestry of, I'm not a geneticist myself, so I'm cautious to try to get this right. The ancestry of um, peoples from the pastoral Neolithic, such as the, um, the baby from Luxmanda, um, they are related to um, groups today, um, both in, in Africa, uh, in um, you know North Africa, in uh, the Horn, that area, um, but also it, people from the Levant, right, from Southwest Asia, and so this shows that they're um, uh, that that they then mixed and came down into East Africa, which makes sense. We know the livestock came from the Levant, um, and so it makes sense that herders did too. Um, okay. Anyway, that's just a very, I'm not sure I explained this very well, but I, I'm happy to try to answer questions about the genetics in a minute. I do, okay, so for this talk, I wanted to try to say something about how what we're doing relates to the work in historical linguistics. Um, and this is something that I know essentially nothing about. Um, but uh, this little paragraph here is from that, the Prendergast ADNA paper that I just showed you. It says, um, other archaeological and linguistic evidence have been jointly used to hypothesize two expansions into Eastern Africa. An initial expansion of herders speaking Afroasiatic, specifically Proto-Southern Cushitic languages from the Horn of Africa, linked with the SPN, the Savannah Pastoral Neolithic, and a second expansion of herders speaking Nilo-Saharan, specifically Nilotic languages, linked with the Elman Titan. So that's the other possible group of people from um, the pastoral Neolithic. And this is uh, pretty entirely based on Chris Eretz's research. Um, and as an archeologist, okay, I approach this um, with something like total avoidance. <laughs> we try not to talk about it. <laughs> so, I mean, we've been trained to not equate material culture types with languages or with you know cultures or with ethnic groups or or whatever and so you know we see pretty fundamental problems with that exercise and um and this is in fact a kind of a good example why right because um the new genetic data show that um the spn and the elman titan are identical in terms of ancestry. They're the same, you know, in terms of genetics, they're indistinguishable. And so the differences in, you know, they make different types of pots, different types of stone tools, they settle in different places. Um, but those, it turns out, are cultural choices, right? We, we don't think these are Nilotic herders and Cushitic speaking herders. I mean, it, you know, maybe everybody was speaking Cushitic languages. Um, but, you know, we don't see our goal as archaeologists as trying to validate these linguistic models, right? We're, we're asking different questions about the past. Um, but that being said, uh, there is 
some collaborative work um, on Iron Age linguistics and archaeology that I really admire. Um, the work that uh, Kate DeLuna and Jeff Fleischer are doing, for example, um, on uh, Bantu linguistics and, and Iron Age archaeology in Zambia. Um, that, that I think is, is really fascinating as an archaeologist. Um, but nobody has tried anything like what they're doing in, in terms of these collaborations um, for older time periods like the pastoral Neolithic. Um, all that currently exists, as far as I know, are these, these models from, from Chris Eret, um, which we try not to talk about for various reasons. Um, and so I would be really interested in hearing your perspectives as linguistic um, uh, uh, folks uh, about, about ways that we could think about these issues together. Um, because I do think there are possibilities and it is a, there's really been very, very little done um, on these topics. Okay. I have a clock. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm gonna, I'm almost done. Okay. Um, so as I said, the, the big research questions that I'm mostly interested in are, are what are the long-term legacies of these ancient herders? Um, and, and, and you know, what can that help us learn about the present? Um, one example of a legacy of, of thousands of years of pastoralist occupation is the discovery that the dung accumulations from livestock pens have really created durable, what we call nutrient hotspots. Um, and, and that can have really positive effects in terms of biodiversity, for example, um, of plants uh, and animals. And, and archeologists have now demonstrated that those effects can last for thousands of years. Um, and so we have to think about places like the Serengeti, you know, at, as anthropogenic landscapes that were created uh, in part by, by these herders who were there 3000 years ago. And we now have, this just came out in a, a soil science journal. Um, we now have very good evidence from Luxmanda um, that, uh, that herders have had really durable uh, and lasting uh, impacts on soil formation uh, in, on the Mbulu Plateau. Um, we can see that these sites from 3,000 years ago, um, uh, they, they have effects um, in terms of the chemical makeup of, of the soil, in terms of the quantities of soil, in terms of all of that, um, that persist today. And that has implications for understanding, you know, the histories of agriculture in this, re in this region. Um, so um, we do have to think about these landscapes in new ways, I think, that take into account uh, what herders have uh, contributed. Yeah. And we only have, I mean, like I said, we've only excavated a little bit, but already with the science that we could do now, um, we've, I think, really been able to make a contribution. Um, another example of long-term legacies of ancient pastoralism in East Africa uh, is about the evolution of lactase persistence. So the ability to digest milk into adulthood. And um, yeah, okay, so white supremacists, for example, today, um, you know, they've been, they go around like, chant, they drink milk, like they think that's like a cool white person thing to do, which is incredibly racist and stupid for all kinds of reasons. Um, but not least of which is the fact that the ability to do that um, originated uh, independently in Africa as well. And so, and spread throughout the African continent um, with pastoralist populations. And so, you know, in terms of how, yeah. So, so can we see how the ability to digest milk today um, e evolved in a process of biocultural evolution? Uh, we, it turns out we can. Um, and uh, this is the last little bit of data that I wanna show you. Um, I'm really interested in food and what food system, pastoralist food systems look like uh, and, um, and how they've changed over time, how they've been resilient or not through time. Um, and you know, today in a lot of places, it's uh, highly diversified, focused on milk when possible, 
Um, people eat meat, fat, especially in the dry seasons or for ceremonies, blood, plants of all kinds. These pictures are from Sam Brew. Um, and, uh, uh, and then of course, you know, lots of people are, are farming today. Um, but, uh, you know, genetic studies of modern populations in East Africa suggest that lactase persistence was really strongly selected for during the pastoral Neolithic. Uh, and we have had zero archeological evidence for this uh, until now. Um, as well, no, that's not true. As of last year, we have a DNA from one individual who lived about 2000 years ago that shows the presence of that genetic variant for lactase persistence. But we've been able to make some progress on this front. Um, I uh, study in collaboration with Julie Dunn at the University of Bristol. Um, we did a huge study of uh, lipid residues in pottery from sites, from the cemeteries up in Turkana, from sites in the Central Rift, and then also from down in uh, Luxmanda. And uh, so what we did, I'm just gonna show you some very technical scientific graphs. Um, we have, we found the earliest evidence for milk, uh, con for milk processing, dairy consumption in East Africa, um, dating to 5,000 years ago at a site up in the Turkana Basin. And the very cool thing about this is now for the first time we have, we can say something about the archaeological context in which lactase persistence was selected for. So in these earlier periods, people had a very diverse diet, actually. They weren't just eating cows or products from cows and sheep and goats. Um, they were eating a lot of fish, uh, a lot of wild resources as well, um, but they were consuming um, milk. Uh, at later sites, um, so down here, let me show you. Okay, so, um, oh no, go back. Um, uh, that uh, at later sites, uh, pots are used almost exclusively for processing carcass fats. That's the, um, the ruminant adipose section here. And you can see how tightly everything clusters. Those are carcass fats. Um, uh, people cook bone soup in pots, which is very similar to how people uh, use pots today. Um, so what it looks like though, is that as herding became more specialized. So people started eating fewer wild animals, really specializing almost entirely on the product of their livestock. Um, that that's when um, people were able to start, that's when we see selection for lactase persistence. So people were started to be able to um, uh, digest milk. It became increasingly important because maybe they, you know, they didn't have, or they didn't rely on the same range of, of wild foods as they previously used to. And then, so as they became more specialized, um, milk may have been more strongly selected for. The next step is collaboration with uh, isotope scientists who can look at um, human teeth and see like actually what people were consuming. This tells us what people were cooking in pots, but um, we can look at people's teeth and we can see uh, actually what they were consuming. And so that's really the next stage of the project to get a finer grain look um, at what diets look like and how they changed over time. Um, that's the big question for us. Okay, especially as this was a period in which climates were changing very dramatically, people were moving and people were having to rely more on uh, livestock than they did in the past. Okay. Um, I just want to say a couple words about community archaeology. Uh, we've done some sort of public outreach and education. My colleague uh, Agnes Skidna um, has really spearheaded a lot of these efforts. Um, she developed a mobile archaeology lab. The next phase of our project is really to think more about food and to think more about plant use in these regions um, to try to understand long-term histories of 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 food systems and plant use uh, on the Mbulu Plateau. And so I wanna do a lot of ethnobotany. Um, I wanna do uh, quite a lot more ethnoarchaeology, which is where my heart really is uh, in archeology. span um, And really, you know, we do need to take uh, sort of uh, 
co-production of knowledge very seriously um, with these uh, communities who have been so welcoming to us on the Mbulu Plateau, um, because I think we can learn learn a lot um, from talking to people and how they have uh, uh, lived over time. And so, you know, this is the, this is looks Monday. This is Mount Hanang in the background. For those of you familiar with this area, um, I think if we're going to understand how people cope with things like climate change today, you know, agriculture is becoming in some places more untenable than it used to be, right? And so maybe um, herding, mobile herding ways of life might be in some ways a fairly good idea. Um, but we, in order to figure out how pastoralism and livestock production really fit into this picture for the, for the future, um, I think we really do need this long-term archeological perspective. And Luxmanda has really shown that these current narratives about pastoralists and their ways of life, like, you know, there was this assumption that these ancient herders were just like the Maasai um, or just like Turkana or something like that. And we, I think those narratives are really insufficient. We can see now that, you know, herding ways of life in the past are hugely variable, hugely dynamic. Um, and, um, you know, there are ways of, of living with livestock in these really resilient societies um, that we're really only now beginning to understand. And so that's why we got to do a lot more work, but um, I think that the long-term picture is becoming um, more clear and that's what we hope to work towards in the future. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, this is my thanks slide. Uh, thanks to obviously Coztec, the museum, University of Dar es Salaam, our antiquities representatives, um, uh, Noelle Aswai and Duberi um, uh Mr. Aswai passed away last year um, and he was a very young guy and uh, we, I want to send specific thanks to him. Okay. Um, and funding is from National Geographic and, and Winter Gren. And okay, <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna look at the clock and hopefully I haven't talked for too long. Okay, yeah, kind of long. Um, but if you have any questions, I am really happy to answer them. Yeah. Great, thank you, Catherine. Uh, yes, I think we can begin the question and answer section. So if anyone would like to ask a question or offer a comment, you can do so using the Zoom chat window or by raising your hand. And also please bear in mind that the audio of the question and answer section is being recorded. And I'll go ahead and start with my own question to give everyone else a chance to, to write or prepare their own questions or comments. So uh, first, thank you again very much for this presentation. And I, I especially appreciated your comments on the, the dangers of uh, equating uh, social or cultural groups with uh, specific archeological yeah. records. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that. And so one question I have, you mentioned briefly the idea of interactions between foragers and pastoralists. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, uh, during this time of the pastoral Neolithic, what sort of archeological evidence is there for East African foraging populations and the interactions between them and the pastoralist populations? Yeah, it, that's a very, that's a great question. Um, we, there's a lot that we don't know, right? So, you know, we know that East Africa was populated by these uh, LSA, hunter-gatherer, hunter-gatherer fishers, for example. Um, and we do have in Turkana, for example, uh, we have evidence um, for contact between hunter-gatherers and pastoralists. Um, the pastoralists were hunting hippos and crocodiles and all kinds of things like that. They were probably exchanging, um, who knows, stone pottery, uh, things like that, beads, whatever, um, with pastoralists. But we don't have, that's really all that we've had until recently, um, sort of uh, hypotheses about, about relationships between herders who came in uh, while hunter-gatherers are already on these landscapes. You know, we kind of assumed that, um, that there wouldn't have been much competition um, between pastoralists and hunter-gatherers because really they're exploiting kind of different landscapes and um, resources and things like this. Um, but, you know, we really didn't know. We have some ADNA data now about this um, that shows that, in fact, there was very little... Um, in terms of uh, 
different communities um like admixture but a genetic admixture between different communities we don't really see that um to a huge degree uh in during the pastoral neolithic so even though hunter gatherers and pastoralists may surely they were in contact right surely they were trading things exchanging things we don't know um i there's very little evidence that those communities that the descendants of those communities like had sh mixed ancestry at all between hunter gatherers or pastoralists we th that doesn't seem to be the case so we're still trying to figure it out. We've excavated some hunter-gatherer sites near Luxmanda at a place called Domboy Rock Shelter. Um, so we uh, there are hunter-gatherers in the area, but right now it's a lot of speculation um, without having any really good answers about what those relationships look like. Besides now from the ADNA, when we realize um, they weren't in that kind of contact in, in any way that has persisted that we can still see today. Yeah. Great, thanks. So that's, that's really quite interesting, especially considering the more recent phenomenon of the uh, Dorobo groups. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. So hunter-gatherer groups that um, then uh, essentially are absorbed into larger, t uh, oftentimes pastoralist uh, groups. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that seems to be sort of a different pattern than what you've seen in the archaeological record. So yeah, it's interesting to to see those differences. Mm, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I guess so. I'll go ahead and read out Omani's question in the chat so that it's sure. in the recording. So he says, "Thank you, Catherine. Uh, with regard to the conclusions made by Christopher Eret, is it not the fact that Eret and older colleagues did not possess DNA-oriented tools of research?" So instead of discarding their findings and conclusions, won't it be good to rearrange their conclusions on cultures of East Africa? In other words, can't we use DNA-oriented findings in archaeology to reshape the previous classification of cultures in East Africa? And by the way, as a layman, I'm wondering, uh, you archaeologists find remains of crops as these uh, crops, uh, the crop produce decomposes? Yeah, no, these are good questions. The Let me answer the... Um, the crop issue. <laughs> yeah. So um, we can often recover, uh, you know, cereal grains and things like this if those remains are carbonized, and because then they preserve forever, basically. Like just a grain of finger mill, it would not preserve archaeologically unless you're in a very dry cave or something like that, which we don't have here. Um, but if they're carbonized, so if a se if seeds fall into a hearth, for example, then they will preserve. And so what we've done, what a lot of other archeologists have done is, um, is employ a technique called flotation where you, you basically take soil samples and then agitate them in water and carbonized stuff floats to the top. And then you can take the carbonized material and, and see what seeds uh, you can find. We have spent years doing this at Luxmanda and have never found carbonized seeds. Um, and no other archaeologists working in East Africa have found any either. Um, so it's, it's possible that if we were to find pastoral Neolithic sites in rock shelters, that maybe we would have better preservation there. The thing about open air sites, carbonized stuff can blow away, it gets trampled, you know, um, we're, for whatever reason, we're not finding it. Um, which is why we have hope that we can find other types of plant uh, on these grinding stones. So phytoliths are these little silica bodies that are in plants and we can identify them to species sometimes. It's really cool. Um, starches, uh, remains of tubers, for example, hopefully we'll be able to find those on the grindstones. Um, so, so yeah, so for, for years and years and years, we always said, look, there's no evidence for domesticates. Um, we've looked for seeds and haven't found any, therefore probably they're not farming. Um, but, uh, I gotta say these grindstones are really, uh, <laughs> suggestive of some kind of very intensive processing of something plant related, uh, and we want to know what. So that's, we're going to put in a big grant to try to figure that out. Um, okay. In terms of the, um, the, the linguistics work, I, 
yeah, I think it's fair to say we, that we are using ancient DNA together with archaeology to reshape how we think about different cultural groups in East Africa. I mean, as archaeologists, it's still true that we're very reluctant to try to match up material culture with groups of people. Um, and, and how the linguistics in the future is gonna fit into these models. That's what I wanna ask you guys about <laughs> because I don't, I don't know. And we've avoided the topic now for a long time. So <laughs> as archeologists. Um, and so, um, so, so yeah, so I, I see no reason why we shouldn't all be thinking about these different lines of evidence, which tell us very different things, um, I, you know, in conjunction with each other. I, I don't really know how to do it, but I certainly, these are things that should be worked on. And it, the archeologists are working very closely with the ADNA people right now, yeah. Great, so. thanks. And then we have a couple of hands. I don't know who is first, sorry about that. Um, I'll let Bonnie speak first. Martin was first. Oh, okay, all right. And I will let Martin speak first. Thank you. Uh, well, to me, this was uh, uh, the, the most exciting talk for a very long time. So thank ah, you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't know whether you know me or my work. So I, I work, I've been on the Boule Plateau for uh, mm. most of my academic wor uh, work, mm -hmm. uh, working on, on Iraq and um, now also, but also in the past, interested in the, the history. Of course. And um, so uh, I will just say I will just say what 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 I think on these things from the, from the linguistic side because yeah, I I, yeah. I agree that the that that we should we should not exclude uh, but we should do it separately in these disciplines and then and then work on our own uh, strength and then see mm -hmm. uh, where we can learn and that is in my view one of the weak points in in Eric that he knew too well what the archaeologists <laughs> wanted to hear. Mm. Um, so the, um, the Iraqu there on the Bulu Plateau are uh, linguistically, from linguistic history, relatively recent. So mm -hmm. not, nothing in your 3000 uh, years okay. ago. They come, they're clearly related to the Gorwa, a bit more distant to the Al Alakwa in Kolo, uh, north of Kondoa, and a bit more distant again to Burungi, uh, uh, um, just uh, east of uh, Kondoa. Mm -hmm. um, and all these languages are very clearly closely related. And so it's clear that the uh, Iraqi people have come from the south, have come from, but not very far, just from mm -hmm. the Kondoa area. And they are relatively new in the Bulu. Also their, their oral traditions, they also recount on, on, on all of that. Um, and, and then when we reconstruct uh, those four languages, we can see that, uh, that they have uh, a, a plenty of knowledge of both agriculture and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, cattle herding. So yeah. I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> with the view that you show from Luxmander because that fits. That's much, much better than, than this model of this uh, people who run around to Maasai, Datoga. Hmm. They, in, I think that this is relatively a new way of doing pastoralism in, in that area. Although the Datoga have been preceded by, I think there's evidence for Southern Nilotic presence before the Datoga, linguistically. Hmm. And I don't understand uh, the, the, the details of that, but we're working on that. We have a project on the history of East Africa, linguistic history of East Africa currently. Yeah. And then uh, for the, the thing is for the, for those Cushitic languages, uh, the, the four that are still there in, in uh, that's still alive in, in Tanzania right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, ultimately, like you say, they must have come from, uh, from, from Ethiopia, from over there. Right. But uh, um, um, maybe different, uh, uh, maybe not in one go. Mm. Uh, we are. Uh, we don't. We have. We can't show this yet. But but we have inklings of of, of indications that uh, that 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 
maybe the, the, uh, that the current day Southern Cushitic languages in Tanzania have two layers, linguistic layers, an older, older one and a more recent one. Uh, so one of the, and, that, and that's why I'm so excited about your mm. books, Manda. It's clear that there is, uh, uh, there must be linguistic uh, uh, Cushitic presence more or less on the, on the, on the, on the Buluk Plateau uh, from the, the links with Hadza. The, some links with Hadza are, are not from current day Iraku, which are the most uh, proximate people now, but clearly from yeah something that was a, the proto language that was spoken by the ancestors of all these uh, Cushitic people. So um, yeah, uh, I have uh, just some indications, uh, and also also from the historical reconstruction that there, there may have been. Uh, first of all, uh, a presence, a Cushitic presence there before the present day Cushitic presence. And secondly, but that's much more speculative, maybe uh, more than uh, more than one mm -hmm. link to wow. to the to the north to Ethiopia. Okay. And whether the Sandawa were always hunter gatherers, I don't know. <laughs> My, our friend Matthew nicely has has worked on that quite a bit, I think, who came to talk to you guys at one point. Yes, yes. And he also yeah. made that point. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. He made a big point of that, that there's a lot of framing and, and we have to be careful mm. in how people are, yeah. are framed and that, that yeah. may be not, uh, not the way. Yeah. Really but certainly the archaeology is only beginning. I think um, in these in these areas. I mean, for the most part, you know, people have been focused on. Well, there's a lot of study of the rock art, for example, um, and then quite a lot of study of Paleolithic, like very old sites. But the, you know, in terms of the pastoral Neolithic, this this is the only site. And one strange thing for us is that we have spent a lot of time doing surveys on the Mbulu Plateau, uh, farther north, like around Manyara and Iasi. And we, especially on the Mbulu Plateau, have found no other sites. Like this is the biggest site by far. There have to be, in all of East Africa, um, for the pastoral Neolithic, there have to be other sites out there. And, but where are, like, where are they? We have been, did you try the Dareda Airstrip? Totally Air unsuccessful. <laughs> Dareda, Air, Dareda Airstrip. Yeah. Did you try there? No. <laughs> no. Next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I would love to do more surveys. And also down by Hana, you know, down on the other side of the escarpment, you know, surely there are sites down there that we just. The openings found. in the now forest, when you walk through the now forest, uh, they're clearly open areas there where people must have been living. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, maybe we could also yeah, work together in, in, in where we think. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> it's been a huge mystery for us. Like, I mean, Luxmanda is so singular in so many ways. And but she also just... found a little bit by coincidence. What's, sorry, what's that? You found that also a little bit. Uh, and we found it, it, it was a complete fluke that we found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we had spent, I mean, we had spent months surveying up near Manyara, finding very little. And at the very end of one of our survey field seasons, you know, we get this phone call from Agnes saying, by the way, there's some pottery down here. And sure enough, like that's what we had been looking for for years. And I mean, maybe our survey methods just aren't very good at this point. Uh, in, in north central Tanzania, but um, I, I would be very curious to talk to other people about landscape use um, in these regions on a sort of bigger scale because we really don't know where to look. Um, so thanks. And yeah. thanks for all the information about the linguistics. No, I, I, would, I would love I, to talk more about this. I mean, yeah. too, and I have to leave. So that's why I took the opportunity and talk and talk and talk. I, yeah. I have to be in another meeting. But oh, no. <laughs> let's please, let, let, let's continue sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much. Yeah. yeah.
Great. Uh, thank you, Martin, for your question. And now uh, move on to Bonnie. Yep. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, try to pass me again. Ah! There we go. All right. The, sorry, the the button, the pop up was coming up and then I was accidentally clicking it away. I, I agree with everything Martin said about the linguistics and, uh, you know, the Hods, I worked on Hadza and the, the Cushitic sort of stratum there, it does hmm. seem to be older than Iraq. So, you know, and this is, a, as with Martin, this is stuff I'm happy to work on the linguistic side of things. Because hmm. for me, the archaeology stuff is the stuff that makes me sort of <laughs> like nervous, like unless people say... <laughs> This culture goes with these, you know, I just don't have yeah. the uh, frame of reference to, to know how to under interpret what's going yeah, on. Sure, sure. So I actually had three linguistic, I'm sorry, three archaeology comments oh, rather yeah. than linguistics ones, but I'm happy to talk linguistics sure. later. First of all, with Agnes Gidna finding this stuff in her house, it so reminds me of the, that great British show Time Team where people are like, we were digging in the garden and we yeah. found some Roman mosaics. Could somebody come and dig here? So and yeah. I, I, watching that show, I thought, I wish there were a Tanzanian Time Team. And <laughs> the same thing, people say, well, we found this, you know, grindstone or we found this. And maybe mm -hmm. Agnes, you know, she's yeah. already done it. So maybe she can facilitate more of that. Yeah. To her credit, so she's a brilliant paleontologist. Actually, she's trained in earlier human evolution stuff mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but we're so lucky to be working with her because obviously she knows she grew up. You know, she grew up here, and um, and at this point knows more archaeology than than most mm -hmm. of us. So um, yeah. And so then my second comment was down in the Tukela River Basin in, in South Africa, Aaron Maisel found that the hunter-gatherers moved from the highlands to the lowlands when the pastoralists came in. And I don't know why that would be. And I'm wondering if there was something similar here or well, if you would, you, you probably don't have the evidence for it, but I'm just wondering right. about yeah. that. Like, if yeah, you that wanted to speculate. That's a good question. I think we are extremely limited by, uh, like, not only do we have very, no, that's grammatically, we don't have very many hunter-gatherer sites at all, and we don't have many pastoral sites. And so in order for us to say something more about, you know, settlement distribution, we'd have to have, there would have to be very intensive surveys over a big area um, and we, we just have to have more data. Like, I think right now, you know, we've got a couple of hunter gatherer sites. We have some rock art, um, but we certainly don't have, I mean, there are no, uh, there are no open air hunter gatherer sites that we have and surely they existed, but we just, there yeah, are some in Kenya, think... but we, we just don't have them. And so in order for us to say anything about like where people were going, or what they were doing, I, I think we need more work. But I like your emphasis on foodways, like were the hunter-gatherers getting salt from Mayasi and taking it up to yeah. things like that. But then my third comment was, there is a word in Hadza for a fl large flat grinding area, and that's where women often are grinding baobab pods. And um, mm, since yeah. baobab are, it is used to curdle milk, right, baobab powder, that, I, that would be something I would consider as, as opposed to a grain as a processing site. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I want to talk about this because I, <laughs> for my dissertation, uh, 10 years ago, I, st I was in Samburu. And one of the things that I studied was grindstone use by pastoralists because of course they don't use it for grains. They use it for like grinding seeds to deworm their goats. Mm. You know, and the, and they're, they're they grind pottery like clay for pottery. Mm -hmm. They grind mm -hmm. ochre. They grind medicines like botanical medicines, and um. And so I, yeah. So I have a whole chapter in my dissertation about this, um, about how we can't just assume that grindstones are for grains. Now the <laughs> the thing though is that. If you look at the Samburu grindstones, they're pretty small, <laughs> pretty portable. Um, whereas these ones that we have at Luxmanda are enormous. And so I, I mean, unless they were processing like wild grass seeds on a 
big scale. The Baobabs is intriguing. I don't know what the previous distribution of Baobabs in this area I was. I was trying to Google it and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. So I don't know. Because <laughs> I don't remember seeing any there, but that certainly doesn't mean they weren't there. Um, but that would be amazing. And I did not well, know that always, about the Hadza, so. Somehow I had the sense with the Hadza that this, this area with the large flat area was up high. I mean, like maybe just geologically, that's where you found the grinding area, the area that, you know, a large group of women could sit on this flat area and have flat stones. I yeah. mean, th I think the sense was that originally you found a naturally flat stone and you ground on it, but these, you know, actual right. crew, you know, so huh. just that physical space those yeah. round spaces just really reminded me of that. That's really interesting. Yeah, we don't, it seems like in these big features, I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these giant grinding stones and they're oriented all which way, which makes it seem like this wasn't a... But culturally, yeah, if you have a people that are like, I'm used to having to, my but... grindstone and nobody else is getting their junk on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weird. And then, and then somehow they got placed in these circular areas. And there's actually a lot of trash dumped on top of them. It's very strange. So I don't, yeah, they were discarded there somehow, but that's literally all we know at this point. Um, Cause we've excavated about a one meter by one meter square. <laughs> so, Which also um, reminds me of time team. Like we only have three yeah. days. And we've got <laughs> it always happens on the last day, you find the best <laughs> thing. Um, so yeah, thanks. I, yeah, I, I would love to learn more about those Hadza grindstones actually. I and you know about them linguistically? About them. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, I just elicited the word. Maybe Amani has actually seen one of them or can tell us more about them if he's seen those. And I, I'll just point out, Andrew wrote in the chat that um, we have a lot of video material documenting uh, contemporary <gasps> Baba processing with uh, the Hadza. Neat. Okay. Yeah, we can try That's to find uh, some of those videos. Yeah, I would. I would love to see. Yeah, because we're writing a bit. We're writing a big grant right now to do to go back and excavate those grindstones at Luxmanda, um, and then to incorporate lots of ethnobotanical work, lots of work on the material culture associated with plant processing, and obviously, I mean, you know, obviously the rock what they're doing now is not what people were doing in the past, but um, I still think we can learn a lot in terms of, you know, the types of plant resources that are in these areas today and, and the ways that people might have been processing. I just want to expand our frame of reference really for how we're talking about these things in the past. Um, Cause right now we, I think we just don't have that much ethnographic data. So very exciting. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um... Floor actually would uh, like to ask a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I had a quick question. I'm I'm not a linguistics. I'm an archaeologist as well. Um, oh right. Okay. Yes, I'm cool. working on the project with Marta, so that's why I'm here. Um, okay. But I had a I had a question on your opinion on the two different, two or three different groups within the Savannah pastoral or the, sorry, the pastoral Neolithic. Yeah. Um, because the indications for Savannah pastoral are quite big. There yeah. are about six or seven uh, ceramic types. And then there's one for, um, uh, sorry, I forgot the <laughs> uh, Elmer Titan. And then you've yeah. got the in which were most likely hunter gatherers, right? But yep. what do you think? think of of this division is it still something that holds today because i think there are some archaeologists and pendergast is one of them yeah uh, who argues that it doesn't work anymore um yeah and that these groups are kind of outdated yes so this is a great question um i i i have a lot of issues with ceramic typology like typologies in general right mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to move away from typologies to some degree to think about how are people using pots and that kind of thing. So I, I wrote a paper with my, my colleague, Carrie Ashley, a couple of years ago that's that's about, um, it, it reviews ceramic literature from East Africa. Oh, and yeah, it's no, like, I, think, I think I read that one. Yeah, um, and it's basically but... like typologies are useful, but you got to think about what they're really telling you and 
Let's also think about some other questions that are maybe more interesting at this point. The thing though, is that uh, Elm and Titan is really distinctive in some ways, uh, and in terms of pottery and also in terms of the lithics, this, those blades, those stone tools. And, um, and they do, and there's also this settlement patterning issue, right? How they tend to, to settle in certain types of areas and SPN settles in other areas. Um, so Elm and Titan has always seemed like a very coherent material culture thing. And, you know, what does that mean in terms of, you know, those people's identity? Like we don't really know, but, um, and then the Savannah pastoral Neolithic has always been more of a grab bag, right? Like, as you've said, it's like the lithic industry is super variable. Um, there are some other pottery types that we don't really know what to do with, like Akira ware and other things like that. Um, and, however, again, at Luxmanda, the pottery that we find there is identical to pottery from the Narasara type site in Kenya. And we also know that the obsidian, like the, the stone tools, that raw material is coming from Lake Naivasha, like that area, right? And so there are clearly ties between these areas because we know we've got stone tool moving and being traded throughout over hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, and, and the fact that we have what looks like identical pottery in these very different places, you know, suggests that at least in, in some sites, we can say, look, this is a really common material culture phenomenon. It seems like what we would call a group, you know, but not all sites look like are, are that clear. There are differences in terms of faunal assemblages, right? Like what people are eating tends to vary a bit. Like at Luxmanda, we have a, people are eating a ton of donkeys. We don't see that anywhere else. Um, and so I think at this point we are, we use those typologies. Like I still believe in an SPN and I still believe in an Elm and Titan, but whenever we write about them, we, we hedge a lot <laughs> in terms of what that actually means, right? Um, and now that we know, in fact, it, it's not like we, these are genetically distinct populations who happen to come in at different times or maybe the same time, we don't really know. Like they're the same, genetically they're the same people, but so then what do these material culture differences mean? I don't know. Yeah, no, but, but they're clear but I, to me. They're clear. I'm, like the pottery is being made in different ways. Like yeah, no, I'm 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 not necessarily a ceramic specialist, so that's, yeah. that's kind of out of my league. But yeah, yeah. but the lithics, like, I don't think there's been enough done on SPN lithics. Like my colleague Steve Goldstein has written a lot about Elm and Titan lithics, and I think he's the person to refer to in terms of stone tools and like a real quality quantitative look at 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 how these different groups are using and making stone tools yeah i really my his work's really great and so i wouldn't throw the typologies out yet but it's good to be i always skeptical. wonder what they mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and there there's i think this is it's a paper from 2003 or something from chami who are where he argues that um, yeah. at least agriculture in in East Africa came from the coastal areas or the Rufiji Delta is is yeah. that something or what what's your opinion on it I I, be, I mean I've I've read one or two papers on on that idea and then I'm, I'm trying yeah. to get a broader yeah. sense it's of, a really of what happened. interesting idea um and you know to their credit they they've done a ton of work and they've published a lot on early food production and pottery types that they find over there. Um, as a ceramicist, I, I'm not super convinced by the arguments for pastoral Neolithic pottery on the coast. Yeah, there, um, there was one way southeast, I think. In, yeah, uh, yeah. Near, near Mozambique. Very far south. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, to me, those do not 
look past from the Olympic, but I've also never seen them in person, so I can't say. But from the descriptions they provide, to me, it's not, it's, it's advertised as incontrovertible proof, but to me, I'm a little more cautious. Um, there's a lot of work now by the Sea Lynx team. So this team from Max Planck has been excavating sites on the coast um, and trying to understand relationships between uh, early food production and, and all these archeological sites on the coast. So Ali Crowther has led a lot of that work um, with Mary Prendergast and Nicole Boivin and, and, and that the sea, yeah, that crowd has been publishing a lot on the coast. And so it's not something I know a lot about, um, but uh, yeah, in terms of the pastoralist part of it, um, I'd like to learn more about that coastal stuff before I would say for sure that like it's there. Yeah, if, I hope that's fair. Yeah, no, no, of course. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, well, Mane wrote in the chat uh, that he oh, hasn't yeah. listed or hasn't recorded any names for uh, grinding stones. Uh, I know okay. we have um, some names for those in the Hatsa lexical data. And I will say uh, Amani uh, has done a lot of work on um, uh, ethnobiology. Yeah. Um, so he yeah does know some things yeah. about that. I would like to be in touch for sure. Uh, and then Bonnie asks a, a, a follow-up question. Uh, it's the distribution of pastoralists or past, pastoralism in drylands uh, because that's where animals graze th uh, the best or because agriculturalists have pushed them out of better watered areas? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's where animals graze best, uh, generally. So, um, and my, my frame of reference for this is in Northern Kenya, but uh, herders up there say um, that the animals breed better in drier areas. I mean, as long as you have some grass, these are, these are, they're what we call, um, there's been a lot of work on rangeland ecology in the last 20 years or so. And, um, you know, it, it kind of used to be thought that the, the goal was to be in the places with the best grass, the best rain, like at all times to just have like huge numbers of cattle and you know, then if some die during a drought, that's okay. But the new rangeland ecology has really shifted. And so now we think about these as what we call disequilibrial systems where um, they, people intentionally, they live in places where there are recurrent droughts, but the, the production system is designed to sort of compensate for those, right? And so you see the numbers of animals may fluctuate, but it's a, it's a pretty resilient, and sustainable way of life, like in these areas where it's it's impossible to do agriculture. There are problems in better watered places with things like hoof rot uh, and they and and also um, animal diseases like sleeping sickness and other um, mosquito borne and tick borne uh, zoonotic diseases, so which tend to be more common in the better watered places. And so um, so generally, yeah, the distribution of pastoralists tends to follow the distribution of like where you would find buffalo right? and, and other like grazing bobbids because that's, um, that's where uh, those animals tend to do the best. Now, it's interesting in East Africa because a long time ago, Pete Robertshaw, who's an archaeologist, pointed out that, um, that a lot of the pastoral Neolithic sites for Elm and Titan tend to be in places that are the best agricultural areas today. And all, I mean, Mbulu Plateau is also obviously known for like intensive agriculture, right? And so, and his argument was they must also have been farming something. Um, but, but part of our problem is that we don't really know what those environments looked like 3000 years ago. So we're trying to do a bunch of work to reconstruct like were these like open grasslands? Were they more wooded? Like what was going on? Um, and also to what degree are the pastoralists in some ways responsible for like the rich soils, for example, that turn out to be really good agricultural areas. So like what it's kind of, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg question that we have a hard time determining like cause and effect that many years ago in the past. Cause we don't have that 
the resolution on the climate data is not that good. The resolution on the like vegetation environmental data is not that good. And the resolution on the archaeology is not that good yet. So, um, so hard to say, but um, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that pastoralists are only in dry land areas because they can't be somewhere else. It's generally, those are good places for animals. Yeah. But herders still have to have access to water and firewood and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. There's a really good book about this for a popular audience, by the way, uh, by Robin Reed, who's an ecologist. It's called Savannas of Our Birth. And it's a look at savanna ecology in East Africa since millions of years ago, but really focuses on herders and the impacts that they've had on environments um, in East Africa. It's a great book. Yeah. Okay, I think, yeah, I think that was all of the questions. So I'd like to thank Catherine again for her wonderful presentation and everyone else for participating today and hope to see you again at our next webinar. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Yeah.